Hello to one and all. This is your new trainer Ophelia Lobo and I will be guiding you with uh, my first online lecture on learning theories. I'm sure you'll have read up uh, or you all have come across uh, the word learning and the word theories and a couple of concepts under, under it. So I'm going to take you through uh, two of the learning theories today, considering they're a little lengthy, and uh, provide you with a fair understanding of how they came about, uh, the concepts within it, and uh, I will be using a couple of examples to uh, explain how they may apply. Uh, outside the book context. So let's begin with the lecture. Now, what is learning? All right, this is something that uh, we must question ourselves and sort of understand that learning is you know, to learn how to do something. Learning to acquire skills for uh, maybe a game or a hobby. Uh, exploring something. Experiencing something new for the first time. Uh, learning connections between things. <clears throat> uh, understanding a new language listening to sounds, making sense of the things around us. So this is something that we are, we have been doing at a very subconscious level since birth. Now in a sense, if we have to talk about learning as a definition, we are looking at a relatively permanent change in behavior a long lasting change right so why why would we call this a relatively permanent change because we must understand that when one learns anything we very rarely unlearn it from our brains and from from uh, the method that we learn from. So when I say relatively permanent, it's more it more or less lasts for a long period of time. And uh, when I understand, what I understand from permanent is uh, when a person learns anything, a part of their brain uh, faces physical changes in order to record what they have learned. So let's look at the second point here on screen. There, there are some physical changes that occur in the brain when learning takes place. As you can understand that uh, there is an imprint or there is a memory of what you're doing right now if you're learning something, if you're learning something from this video. You're going to remember not everything, but you're going to remember parts. You're going to remember words. You're going to remember meanings from it. And you're going to probably make associations and connections with what you already know. Or maybe you're going to make new connections and new memories. So therefore, even if you uh, probably are not able to recall everything on a test, it doesn't mean that you have not learnt those concepts they're very much there in your mind in your memory but maybe at that point in time you cannot recall right so when when we say relatively permanent change we are mostly looking at the physical change that uh, is implied in our nervous system right now that's our understanding of what learning is in psychology 
now if i have to look at the next point uh it would definitely follow from what we understand of learning is how do we learn now i think uh like i mentioned before learning takes place right from birth right from observing things uh listening to sounds making sense of connections in in the world around us in our surroundings uh as simple as understanding sunrise and sunset and learning that this is uh the universal habit uh and uh, this is something that happens every day and it's just the way things are so learning can happen through exploration through personal experiences making connections uh uh linking information which is indirectly called association and uh, you know when you're introduced to a new hobby or 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 a new class then you practice you keep practicing so we see learning in different ways so let's look at the three ways of how we essentially learn experiences associations and practice now experiences um count account for everything that we experience around us whether we are actively or passively learning right we we understand that our actions have consequences we understand that our actions have results we watch others their habits their actions their behavior uh we also understand through associations that uh two things sometimes occur together either successively or together we tend to make connections between events and we notice predictors in our environment humans don't like to be alarmed by things so we have this understanding that something will precede the other or something follows the other so all this linking of information all of this understanding grasping making sense out of it practicing certain skills accounts for the methods of learning now when when we talk about learning in terms of changes in behavior i would like to uh make you aware that there are a lot of other changes that we can talk about which would not relate to learning okay you might you might have a question mark when i say this but let me give you an example now if uh, a person meets with an accident and uh, succumbs to some kind of a brain injury the change in his behavior after the brain injury does not relate or account to what learning is about okay another example is when your body grows and there are a lot of changes happening within your body in terms of your hormonal changes or the shape of your body your height your weight these changes are not implicated in behavior so any physical change bodily changes brain changes anything to de- to to be related to uh body maturation any disease due to which there are changes in behavior will not account for learning so we must understand that though uh relatively permanent changes in behavior is learning they have to be exclusive of diseases physical damage and body growth all right so please understand that if tomorrow you uh you know you 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 sleep in a probably in a bad position at night and you wake up with a cramp in your leg and you're not able to walk straight there's a change in behavior but you see there is no connection to learning here all right so we need to exclude those aspects and only look at profit or gain which brings us to our next point which is profiting from experiences all right now what i what do i mean by profiting from experiences is 
learning could be uh, defined more simply if we have to look at what we benefit from an experience therefore which causes a change so they can be useful things they can be harmful habits but anything that we gain stays with us and it teaches us something and that essentially is learning so i hope i've clarified uh, in layman terms and even in terms of psychology what learning is all about and this is going to give you an idea more into the cognitive and the behavioral aspect that's going to be our focus for the rest of the lecture all right so let's move on we're going to look at two theories of learning classical conditioning and operant conditioning all right i'm sure you've heard the terms i'll take you through uh, every bit of it in this video Now let's look at classical conditioning. Uh, the man you see in the picture is uh, a Russian physiologist by the name of Ivan Pavlov. Right, Ivan because it's Russian. The anglicized version would be Ivan. So if you're comfortable with Ivan, I would use Ivan. Right, but don't be confused if I say Ivan. All right, so. Um, Mr. Pavlov was actually studying uh, the digestive system in the dogs that he had at his lab. And he actually built a device that would measure saliva being produced in the dog's mouth when they were fed some uh, amount of food. Right. And uh, during this period of time of experimentation and uh, research, and trying to find something out of it, he accidentally stumbled upon the principles of classical conditioning. All right, so uh, coming from a different field and then having its implications in psychology, let's see, let's see what happens next. So if you look at this, this is, um, uh, you know, the setup, the experimentation setup where he was studying the automatic reflexes and digestion, which is definitely starts with salivation or with what we call as drooling when we see something that we like to eat so what he noticed uh, obviously from the physiological point of view that when food was presented the dogs would salivate now this is a very normal reflex response right it's an involuntary response this is not something that uh, you know most often than not your brain can you know completely control okay so the food causes a particular reaction which is uh, salivating so here there was an understanding that the stimulus is food and the reaction is drooling all right now let me take you through a few more things We're going to go through the elements uh, in this, in this, uh, under this theory right now to completely understand what the experiment or the, the research topic was about by Pavlov, right? So uh, don't feel very disconnected because I'm going to cover a little theory right now, but I will keep referring to the experiment uh, under every point. So please stay with me. The first one is uh, what we're going to talk about is the food, which is the natural stimulus, naturally occurring stimulus. Okay, it's called in, in under the theory, it's called as the unconditioned stimulus. Why would we say unconditioned? Because there is no conditioning here. There is no learning that if you see food, you must drool. There is no learning here in this connection. It's a very biological reaction and a biological wiring that generally when an, when an organism sees food or is hungry or uh, even looks at visuals of food, uh, definitely there is a certain brain response going around and certain biological uh, responses in your body, even if you are not evidently salivating, 
right so food here is the unconditioned stimulus right that's our first element now let's look at the next the response to the food which is you know drooling and salivating is called the unconditioned response okay it's the natural reflex involuntary response to the sight of food so we have ucs ucr please keep a note of these abbreviations i would be using them in the further slides all right so if you look at this connection food naturally induces salivation let's move to the next right now we have to understand uh, this in terms of uh, pavlov's experiment so what really uh, you know caused curiosity in pavlov was that he he began to realize that his dogs would start salivating uh, at times when they were not really supposed to 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 drool all right and what do we mean by this like uh, you know uh, i mean if i've got a pet in the house and i've grown up with pets so i've also noticed that you know it's not necessary that if if the if the animal visually uh, has an ha, has an understanding of the food coming around them they're going to start drooling uh, they start learning different cues associated with food such as uh, maybe you you know like you know if there are ruffling sounds of their food packet or uh, if they hear the sound of the vessel in which of the food is to be kept or if if at a certain time in the day they're tuned to you know kind of eat and they're hungry around that time so these are different stimuli which makes them salivate and it's not food it's not the sight of food so we must understand here in relation to the experiment that what pavlov realized is his food uh, his his uh, uh, dogs would start salivating when they saw either you know his lab assistant trying to bring in their food or when they when they kind of heard the sound of their cage uh, latches opening or uh, you know or or maybe just because of the time in the day where they eat so these are not naturally occurring stimuli this is not an organic biological stimulus to drool for right so pavlov spent quite amount of time uh understanding why dogs would salivate to something that's probably not naturally inducing uh the response of salivation so some uh, so let's look at what's on the screen a stimulus that cannot naturally produce a reflex response is called a neutral stimulus right so there is no real value to the stimulus um uh, there's an a, a value which could probably be added because it acts like a cue or because there's some association with it with the food all right so typically your in your experiment the bell is the neutral stimulus now let's look at uh, the next element which is conditioned stimulus now this is where the conditioning aspect comes into play all right the stimulus produces a reflex response when paired with the original stimulus now what i mean by that i've i've, I've mentioned here bell plus food which means that if i want to understand uh, or teach the dog that you know uh, a little uh, you know probably he needs to um, start responding to the bell alone what i would do is i would start pairing the bell and the food over a couple of trials and a couple of uh, you know settings to then eventually have the same response only to the bell and not to the food so if we look at this definition here it is an understanding that when the bell okay when the bell which is the stimulus is paired with the original stimulus which is food eventually over several pairings a reflex response that is of drooling or salivating is produced when that connection takes place our bell becomes the conditioned stimulus okay so now it's our understanding that the bell causes the response of salivating after a couple of seconds or minutes the food would follow 
so when we we can't say that the food has caused the salivation we can pretty much say that you know the sound of the bell uh, you know kind of stirs up the hunger in them and you know they're probably ready to gear up and eat right okay so let's look at the last element of this aspect uh, what is the cr so the cr is conditioned response which is a learned reflex response to the new stimulus so which is this new stimulus here it's the bell right yeah and why are we saying it's a learned reflex response a reflex response is a natural response so why are we saying learned because although it is the same reaction the stimulus is different and if the stimulus is different that means some amount of learning has occurred therefore we would use learned reflex response when we have to understand what a conditioned response is so the response is the same it's just that the association with a new stimulus uh, is indicative that learning has occurred so you see um, the bell now is causing salivation not the food in the previous slide the equation was food arrow salivation now we have completely replaced after several uh, times of pairing the bell and then the food eventually the food doesn't have to be shown for the dog to feel hungry or to salivate he would salivate only to the bell right this is classical conditioning okay so this is just a a, a preview of all the abbreviations and uh, for you to just quickly take a revision of what we've covered the ucs is the unconditioned stimulus and the food has the power to elicit a con unconditioned response which is a natural response of salivating after a period of time we start utilizing the bell and pair it with the food uh, to elicit the response of salivation to the point where we can exclude the presentation of food and only present the bell to elicit salivation which is our conditioned stimulus and conditioned response right i hope it's clear till here um let's move on okay i'm going to take you through a few um uh concepts in this uh in this theory which are apart from the elements that we just covered all right you will come across these words in in your master's textbooks in your sy textbooks and on information over the internet so let's get a little acquainted with it the first one is acquisition okay acquisition comes from the word to acquire which means uh essentially under this theory it's acquiring the learning that your neutral stimulus which is the bell is a predictor of your unconditioned stimulus which is the food so the dog predicts over the presentation of the bell that food is going to come now and i am going to gobble that food so it's always uh, uh you know preferable to keep a memory of this that the neutral stimulus has to precede the food all right that is very essential for learning to occur through classical conditioning okay so there is there is a knowledge um the knowledge that uh, you know the bell and the food presented together causes salivation is is called acquisition okay under classical conditioning let's look at the next term extinction now in layman terms it definitely means uh you know when something does not exist or it slowly develops to cease to exist right so let's look at what it says it's the weakening or disappearance of the conditioned response what's the conditioned response it's salivation okay it's the weakening or the disappearance of this response due to the removal or the absence of food after presenting the bell okay uh it might sound a little complex but uh to put it in terms of uh, the experiment to you if at all during your uh, you know pairing pairing of the bell and the food if you see now 
conditioning has occurred right but it's an understanding that the bell is uh, uh, you know presented and uh, whatever there's a sound of the bell and the dogs salivate because they're waiting they're anticipating that you know there will be food right but what ends up happening if you do not present food for you know uh, quite amount of time where after uh, presenting the bell and the dog is still waiting for the food to come in so what's going to happen eventually that that response of salivation is going to die out because it makes no logical sense that if you you present the sound of a bell and nothing follows after that what is the dog salivating for so the body the the body of the dog and the biological process of the dog learns that i am not going to be presented with food so that that mechanism of salivating slowly weakens to the point where it probably disappears and becomes extinct so that is extinction all right this happens even with children if um if we have taught them you know like uh, uh a couple of things where in in terms of conditioning is involved and if something that uh is naturally desirable like a candy or something is absent they don't feel motivated to finish their work so you will see extinction of a new learned response that you had spent a lot of time trying to train them for but we we must understand that if we have already talked about the fact that it's a permanent change right then why must we look at extinction if learning is a permanent change how can it how can some response or some learning become extinct so that is where the next concept would come in which is spontaneous recovery <clears throat> so what we understand by this is the conditioned response reappears okay after extinction suddenly if uh, you know after like say a period of 5 6 days the the dog just naturally hears the sound of a bell from somewhere so somewhere he might feel that oh you know the thought comes up that oh you know probably i'm going to be fed now but it's a fairly weak response so he's not going to like be all like up and standing on his fours and all ready to eat but he's he might probably just lift his ear or look in the direction of the bell and wonder that oh you know uh, you know am i got every dog has its day so am i going to have food now right so it's a fairly weak response you would uh, in terms of if you have to measure the if pavlov was measuring the amount of salivation i would say that he would not uh, uh, you know he would definitely see a difference in the amount of saliva um, secreted uh, in the beginning of his experiment and to the point where spontaneous recovery has occurred in his experiment so we have to understand that it's it's a brief recovery of a resp- of this response when by chance if the presentation of the condition stimulus that is be it a bell or be it a reminder or something comes up after extinction has taken place all right so spontaneous recovery also follows from extinction if extinction has not occurred spontaneous recovery will not occur obviously because Uh, that that means that the link is very much there all right so i hope this is pretty much clear to you yeah acquisition is learning learning the association between your bell and your food extinction is when uh, the dog eventually stops salivating because food is not presented after the bell is presented so that that reaction becomes extinct but in a one hour case when the the dog or, or the organism may uh suddenly be presented with uh with the condition stimulus there might be a small uh reappearance or a uh, elic- eliciting of the conditioned response but it would be a weak response it would not be a fully charged response all right so this this can be related in terms of um um any habits or any thing anything that a child is learning but suppose you know it's it's not been revised for a long time or certain associations have which have been built have not been used then uh 
you know he might have these clues in his mind but he might not be able to make sense of everything so you can definitely apply these three uh, topics which you can see right now even uh, with your children and that's the application part which we'll be working on when we meet so uh, you know uh, let's leave the application for uh, later let's move on um, I'm going to take you to the last two concepts under classical conditioning which is stimulus generalization okay now generalization definitely means uh, something is similar to the other therefore you know we generalize right so if we're talking about stimulus generalization we have to understand that uh, the conditioned response is produced to a stimulus which looks or sounds or seems similar to the conditioned stimulus so uh, if uh, this is not part of the experiment okay what i'm going to explain next but it's just an understanding for you instead of um, the bell okay which is generally a rung and then the food comes and then the dog eats at some random point in the day the doorbell sounds probably similar to the bell that's presented in the experiment all right now if both these stimuli sound similar there is a chance that the dog might think that this is my time to eat because the bell has been rung and therefore he might elicit the conditioned response which is salivation so this is stimulus generalization are you getting from where this this concept is coming from it's the tendency to respond to a stimulus that is more or less similar to the origin original conditional stimulus which is the bell all right so this happens uh, kind of even with us you know in in many situations in life uh, you know we are so accustomed to uh, giving a response to a certain sound of uh, you know maybe uh, uh, you know a message tone or a voice call or whatever that even if it doesn't ring or sometimes we think that's vibrating and it doesn't vibrate even if there's another stimuli in, stimulus in the environment which is very similar to what we generally respond to we end up responding to that so typically stimulus generalization can be applied to a lot of things that happen every day all right let's look at the last next one stimulus discrimination so this is pretty much opposite of what we just understood when your conditioned response is not elicited to a generalized stimulus which is similar to the conditioned stimulus because this simil similar stimulus is not paired with food so when i when i say uh, that you know there is stimulus discrimination it means that the dog has now realized that you know when the doorbell rings it's the doorbell you know there's no food that follows so over a period of time through kind of trial and error he he realizes that these two are different from each other therefore i you know i i need to discriminate and uh, you know discreetly understand that the sound of the bell and the sound of the doorbell are different so in in uh, looking at the definition again on the slide when the conditioned response which is drooling is not elicited to the uh, generalized stimulus which is the doorbell it is because this doorbell is not paired with food so when when a lab assistant probably just wants to come in and or or, or you know like you know ring the bell of of the lab or whatever if he has to come in and the sound represents the sound of the bell the dog will eventually learn that these two are different stimuli and only one of them generally gives me food the other doesn't so that is stimulus discrimination and this is more or less like a realization and therefore the dog eventually learns that when the doorbell rings i'm not going to drool <laughs> in layman terms all right so stimulus di discrimination would occur when an organism learns to respond to different stimuli in different ways okay so let's move on um, before i cover operant conditioning i'll quickly run you through the experiment that was um, 
kind of the groundwork for uh, operant conditioning, which is called the law of effect. Uh, I hope you've heard of Thorndike. Yeah. Um, so we're going to <clears throat> we're going to look at uh, uh, the next part of the video. So this is Edward Thorndike and the American psychologist who uh, you know experimented with the puzzle box and cats right and he came about with the law of effect so let's look at the puzzle box this is what it looks like all right there is a uh, you know there are a couple of suspensions over the box there is a lever inside which the cat has to press to come out there is a dish of food and it's a box the cat is more or less trapped all right and this big fat bar of wood that's right in front the flat bigger bar wider bar is the door so if if the cat um even accidentally or eventually learns that on tapping off the lever this shutter would open it would come out and eat the food so this is what the experiment is all about let me take you through it the cat is inside the puzzle box and what thondike wanted to see is how it would come out and definitely he had kept some mechanism for it to learn to come out so initially the cat is obviously restless and it's it's making a lot of movements inside the box it's unnecessarily moving here and there trying to probably put its head between two two logs of uh two two patches of wood somehow trying to find her way out through several trials and errors she may have accidentally or in some way or the other figured that you know there is something that i can press which which causes some different uh out outcome which i've not seen before so it probably ends up pressing the lever and it has learned its mechanism to get out now what we need to understand is uh you know eventually the cat uh you know opened the door because it it pushed the lever and we have to understand that there are two things that it has probably gained from this experience one is escape okay and we are we are going to look at escape as a gain because she she felt probably trapped inside and the second is food so there were two pleasurable consequences escape and food and this uh based on this research he developed the law of effect which states that um if a response is followed if any behavior is followed by something pleasurable then it will be repeated again and again so now if if thondike has to run a few trials of putting the cat inside her uh, unnecessary movements would keep on reducing in every trial to the point where she comes in like okay like if if you put me inside i'm just going to press the lever and come out within the same minute so a lot of trial and error learning has taken place here and that's the understanding so this would sway both ways all right if a response is followed by something pleasurable it would be repeated because it has been learned also if a response is followed by something unpleasant then it will not be repeated so it's both ways all right and this formed the basis for our next topic which is operant conditioning now this is uh, b f skinner he is also an american psychologist and he was of this understanding that individuals operate voluntarily upon their surroundings which means this this is sort of opposing what classical conditioning says if you noticed classical conditioning focused a lot on reflex responses which means involuntary responses but uh, what we must understand is that uh, uh, learning a reflex depends on what comes before the response in classical conditioning right it's before the response so your food is presented before the response your neutral stimulus that is the bell is uh, presented before the response and that's how the pairing uh, causes learning and that's how conditioning takes place but in operant conditioning the learning depends on what happens after the response now what comes after the response it's the consequence i just i just explained to you right it's a pleasurable consequence or it's an unpleasant unpleasant consequence so we must look at voluntarily acting on our 
uh, on on actions and and presenting our behavior because we understand that if i do this i'm going to get this so there is uh, a very conscious uh, attempt of behaving that way that is why he would use he has used the word voluntarily okay so voluntary behavior is equal to operant behavior so uh, it's purposeful behavior because it is followed by a reward now let's look at uh, bf skinner's experiment um, there are a lot of memes on this where there's there's this little mouse that you know holds up this uh, banner and says uh, you know uh, will do anything will press lever for food i don't know if you've seen it but it's pretty famous so this is related to the experiment definitely if you can see there's a light there there's a lever there is uh, you know just like a water dispenser for the rat uh, there's a food dispenser which is connected to the lever so if the if the rat presses the lever a pellet of food would drop in which it would eat and there's an electrical grid at the base on which the rat is sitting which would at times give it shocks now this is this is similar to the previous one which we understood in the puzzle box of cats okay but let's see how this is a little different so the rat is inside the skinner box uh, it's making random movements to get out and at times shock is delivered because of the grid below now in in all this frenzy it accidentally presses the lever and a food pellet falls in that food dispenser section so here there is learning that has occurred the rat has learned that if i press this lever and not just waste my time running around here and there i am going to get food and probably not even get shocks in certain areas of the grid so what has ha occurred learning has occurred and in terms of reinforcement so the food the pellets reinforce the behavior of pressing the lever again and again so the rat doesn't necessarily need to get out now it doesn't feel unsafe because it's being fed and all it has to do is press a lever right so this is the experiment that uh, uh, you know he conducted to understand how reinforcement works how giving rewards works and how from random movements we start understanding that if we voluntarily and consciously do something we get something out of it therefore we operate in this manner and we make a connection in this manner to be able to gain those rewards in future without wasting too much time so let's move to the concepts under operant conditioning what is reinforcement right we we just covered the fact that food uh, reinforced the behavior of pressing the lever so what is reinforcement reinforcement is is that process of strengthening the behavior increasing the chances that the behavior will be repeated but this is not just going to happen through a process right we need a reinforcer to reinforce a behavior we need something uh, it could be uh, you know for kids it could be candy or it could be praise or it could be like a giving stars on their books or um, you know it could be uh, appreciating them in front of the whole class so these are reinforcers to allow the desirable behavior which is performing well keeping consistent efforts to keep on continuing throughout the academic year all right so let's look at the two types of reinforcements we have positive reinforcements all right the first one and negative now what is a positive reinforcement okay it's uh, a positive reinforcement is when a behavior is repeated again and again because there is a pleasurable stimulus that follows it so if you add a pleasurable uh, stimulus the behave there is a likelihood that the behavior will increase so if you look at uh, we just covered if you look at this picture excellent good job perfect so these are uh, ways of motivating and pushing children to do better it's praise uh, something as uh, you know intangible as praise is uh, you know going to help you to push the child to do better it's going to allow consistency it's going to allow repetition of good behavior of good study habits so you see how it's very much connected to what you're you're doing every day in this internship 
right what you are aiming to do what the teachers are aiming to do let's look at negative reinforcement it's the repetition of your behavior because you remove an obstruction or you avoid an unpleasant stimulus so um let's look at this example okay this is something that i use with with uh, my children and um you know you see a boy brushing there and this is something he does every day because he wants to avoid dental problems and socially embarrassing situations which is bad breath so if you want to avoid something unpleasant you do something for it so you keep on making it a habit to brush every morning to clean your mouth to rinse your mouth and do all those sorts of things with all those fancy toothpastes so that you don't have bad breath so it's the repetition of a behavior to avoid something unpleasant okay that's the uh, negative reinforcement here you're not adding any pleasurable stimulus you're avoiding a pleasurable stimulus therefore you just you know consider uh, doing something so for example a uh, very simple example i'll give you if you uh, you want to avoid trouble with traffic cops it's best to follow signals so you keep on repeating that behavior that i will follow you know the red and the green signal every everywhere my bike or my car goes because i do not want to face them and i do not want to get myself into paying them fines or bribes or my get having my license uh, taken away okay even as simple as if i want to avoid i cannot avoid accidents but i can definitely avoid hurting my head so i would rather wear a helmet so you keep on protecting yourself and wearing your helmet so that you avoid chances of getting hit so that's negative reinforcement all right now let's look at reinforcers now these are the things that you use to strengthen behavior reinforcement is a process reinforcer is something that you use to strengthen behavior all right let's look at the two types primary reinforcer now now this has nothing to do with what we just covered in the previous slide okay this has nothing to do with positive and negative reinforcement now these are reinforcers these are the things that we would use to strengthen and improve our behavior so in primary reinforcer uh, look at the explanation it's a naturally it's it's naturally reinforcing by meeting a basic need or a biological need so if we have to look at a child who's uh, you know an infant who's crying and is probably hungry obviously the thing to do would be to feed the child what do you get out of it you get uh, you know the child to be quiet and the child is soothed because he's being fed and therefore his hunger subsides and he's fine so this is meeting a basic need and that in itself is a primary reinforcer so if you if you have to identify the primary reinforcer here it would be food and food naturally reinforces the behavior of uh, having the child become calm because it meets the need of hunger okay i hope that's clear now let's look at secondary reinforcer now secondary reinforcers become reinforcing after it is paired with the primary reinforcer so uh, you can't say that money money is a primary reinforcer no because money doesn't satisfy hunger money helps you to buy food and it is food that helps you satisfy your hunger so money and food have to be paired money would be secondary food has to be primary and when they are paired together your hunger subsides all right so let's look at another example in this picture which i've just shown you um uh, there is there is a guy petting his dog and uh, so that's touch right uh, any form of uh, any biological need like touch uh, uh, you know hunger thirst sex if these needs are met that's your primary need for so so he's already touching his dog right he's patting his head and he also says good boy so what has he done he has paired touching and praising him together so there are two reinforcers here and this strengthens good behavior this strengthens desirable behavior all right so let's move on
Now, this is a very important concept under operant conditioning. Shaping. Now, in, in a sense, you can understand what shaping would mean. It would mean uh, trying to, uh, you know, make something look like an end product. Trying to gain something out of uh, working on something. So you continuously work on, on, on a presentation till it gives you the desired output. But how does shaping apply in the same sentence that I said in psychology, in, in operant conditioning? Let's take a look. We What we do in, in the concept of shaping, if you're applying this to behavior modification, is the small steps that are incorporated towards achieving the ultimate goal are reinforced, which means they are rewarded till the goal itself is achieved. Which means that if you're teaching your child, uh, if, you're, if your goal is, you know, inculcating a good study habit. Now, this is, uh, you know, a very vague concept. Like Good study habit means what? Means it could be something like a regular studying pattern, studying every day for whatever, two hours, uh, you know, uh, ensuring that the child has enough attention even after coming from school. So all those things. So that's your goal, right? The child should be able to come back and do some revision and some skill development for uh, maybe an hour or two after school. That's your goal. To establish a, uh, you know, a daily study pattern for the child. Now, the child hates studying. Okay, and definitely wants to just go and run around and play right after school and he's not gonna sit for two hours, definitely not. So how do you get him to do this? You literally bribe him. Okay, you literally bribe him. So what you would do is you would um, probably break it down into small parts or small steps. You would start with 15 minutes. You would start with easier tasks because, you know, if he feels that he can do something, then he's probably a little motivated to try something that's a little more complex. So you start developing interest. And what you do every 10, 15 minutes, you give him praise, you give him a star, you, uh, you know, you add, you add stars to his star chart, which eventually, uh, you know, he can exchange for a token. And from that token, he can buy something for himself. So you're understanding where this is going. You're breaking down his goal into small parts and you're rewarding every small successive step so that finally you achieve your ultimate goal. So in shaping what we do is we give rewards <coughs> or reinforcers for each successive step. This is called successive approximations. All right. So you will find this concept in uh, slightly higher level books where shaping is the reinforcement of simple steps in behavior that eventually helps you to achieve the bigger goal, right? So example, another example could be teaching your dog to jump through a hoop. What would you do first? You definitely cannot push the dog from one side to jump to the other side of the hoop. You would definitely use a treat you would use a chewy or you would use um uh, you know a food pellet so what you would do is you would hold the loop in front of the dog at the floor level right and from the other end you would extend your hand with a with something that smells like food and tastes like food and you would bring it close to his nose you know slowly guide him take it away from him take it away from him till he walks through the hoop and then you give him the treat in his mouth you do this a couple of times so he is not going to hesitate now. He knows that he has to walk through the loop. He'll get the pellet of food. Maybe in a day or two, you start raising the loop a little from the floor. So you make him hop a little bit instead of just walking through. And that hopping eventually becomes jumping. So you keep on raising the height of your loop from the floor. And definitely the loop comes high enough from where you want the dog to jump. And you keep, you keep on giving him the treat till a point where he knows that, you know, even if there's no treat, he's going to jump because it's a habit. Learning has occurred. And slowly and steadily, you can uh, alternatively give him treats and eventually stop giving him the treat. So you have taught your dog how to jump through a hoop. If any of you have a dog at home, please experiment. Right? So can you see the picture? She's probably holding some treat in the distance. And uh, she's training her dog to jump from a level which is much higher than the ground. 
so this is shaping right we are going to shape behavior or uh, we are going to achieve a goal by giving small rewards for every success in which the goal is broken down into okay now this is something very important which we need to understand in terms of behavior modification okay more than this being a part of the theory i'm going to talk more application now when it comes to punishment okay we'll cover both theory and application for this particular aspect now what is punishment punishment and reinforcement are polar opposites okay if you remember in reinforcement i have underlined the word strengthening behavior now look at punishment something that occurs after a response which reduces the probability of that response so if you are going to give one tight slap to a child because he has lied then you are assuming you are assuming okay it's not the solution you are assuming that he was probably not going to lie again so you reduce the probability of that habit or of that response from happening again and what do you use you use punishment you use some form of behavior or you use some consequence which is completely unpleasant and it reduces the chances it does not strengthen the chance it does not increase the chance check out the word it's it's reduce all right now look let's look at positive there are two types there's positive punishment there's negative punishment so under positive punishment uh, the understanding is you add something aversive okay you add now let me get this very clear to you punishment in no way under your comprehension skills is positive all right punishment is not positive it's termed as positive punishment because you're adding a stimulus to reduce a response okay so you are adding a stimulus to reduce a response but this stimulus is something aversive something that you know has a negative impact something that someone does not like for example hitting a child so when you raise your hand on your child you are adding one behavior from your side thinking that his behavior which is negative will reduce now on another note it doesn't reduce it just adds to more problems like humiliation insult and it just adds to the baggage of emotional problems so punishment generally does not work unless it's uh, extreme criminal offenses where sometimes punishment is the first step for uh, you know like a like a time out let's look at another example parking violation so in other countries if you park in a wrong place uh, or a wrong spot you uh, definitely you get a parking a ticket which is hooked on to the uh, wind screens on your car or it's it's put into your bike and uh, it's if your vehicle is illegally parked so you have to pay a certain amount of fine for it so you're adding something which that person does which and nobody likes right you're adding a fine so th- it's a punishment right when you're caught breaking a rule and you have to pay a fine it's a punishment okay you definitely learn 10 times before breaking the rule a rule the next time but i'll tell you how punishment does not work okay especially when it comes to children now let's look at what negative punishment is yet again we're not getting into the uh, english aspect of positive ne- punishment negative punishment okay punishment is punishment but we're looking at adding or subtracting now in negative punishment we are subtracting something desirable so it's exactly the opposite of positive punishment okay in punishment you can either add something that you know that's going to uh, where the child is just going to get it from you and in negative punishment you are going to take away something that he likes so you're going to subtract something desirable all right as simple as uh, let's look at the second picture i'll explain the first picture a little later you see uh, you know a, a stick figure playing football and you see a you know a cross board on it which means that no play time for you so the child is like dying to look forward to play time after he comes back from school and you uh, maybe he tells you his marks you know his maths marks and they're pretty bad 
according to you right so out of anger you know you say that oh, no play time for you today you didn't do well we studied so much and you didn't do well so no play time for you today now let me give you an understanding that punishment never is the solution because it does not change behavior if your aim was to help the child to get good marks by taking away one hour of his play and punishing him he is not going to get good marks by spanking the child and humiliating the child the child is not going to learn anything the child may probably not lie again but he is carrying humiliation for the rest of his life so punishment is something that we must avoid in terms of behavior modification all right so if you look at the first picture the probably the guy has broken some traffic rule and uh, the officer is probably confiscating his license so even taking away it is something desirable right because if you have a license you can drive around the whole city so taking away of license is also a an example of negative punishment all right i hope we are all together um uh, on this uh, topic and i know it's a bit of a long video but um, uh, this is how your topics are going to be they're going to be a little lengthy so i need you to be um, completely there with me all right <clears throat> now this brings us to the end of the presentation which is schedules of reinforcement now when i mean schedules i mean uh you know like how much of reinforcement to give or how often of uh, we must uh, give reinforcements or give rewards so don't look at uh, everything right now that appears on the screen just look at the red boxes all right it says partial or delayed reinforcement and it says continuous intermittent or immediate reinforcement now if you look at um, both these tabs let me explain the second tab to you continuous intermittent or immediate reinforcement now immediate reinforcement is something that works with children and with animals the moment they perform a behavior that you are expecting them to perform you reward them in that very moment in that very same moment and you continuously reward them because they continuously behave well so what it means is look at the second tab giving rewards every single time so every time the child does something well be it a 5 mark test or 10 mark test or every day even homework is done for something as basic as doing homework you are rewarding the child every single time that is called continuous reinforcement all right immediate reinforcement okay so it's the reinforcement given for each and every correct response every single time okay now the now obviously i can see a lot of thoughts probably i can see a few thoughts going on in your head i'm assuming that there are a few thoughts in your head that are if we give them rewards every single time then uh, they're going to get used to it 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 might get into get into a sort of a bad habit that now they're going to expect a reward every single time so how does this help now of course this helps only temporarily if you look at the second point the learner acquires desirable behavior very quickly because every time he does it even if he does it 50 times a day you give him 50 rewards that's how literal it is all right so the behavior is learned very quickly the behavior that you want him to learn the desirable behavior is learned very quickly because every time he does it or every time he shows that he's doing it or every attempt is being rewarded so if a child hates studying even an attempt to show interest to sit and study with his books is rewarded now this is only profitable for the uh, behavior to develop and become a habit but after that if you stop giving rewards because you think that okay you know he's he's established his uh, habit of you know not telling lies or uh, you know doing his homework every day once you stop giving rewards what's going to happen it's like going cold turkey right you're giving rewards every day 10 times a day and suddenly on the 11th day no rewards 
or maybe just five rewards. So what happens? The behavior is lost quickly. So behavior is learnt quickly. It can also be lost quickly. But let's look at the one on top, which I definitely recommend for behavior modification is partial or delayed reinforcement. Now, if we look at this aspect, uh, we're looking at giving rewards part of the time or at certain periods of time. So here what happens is probably the habit that you're trying to teach them or the behavior that you're trying to teach may take a little longer in terms of learning. But the learning will last longer. You know, it's about the bigger picture, like we say. So eventually the child will end up learning and remembering the good habit that you're teaching him for a longer period of time in life. And also look at the third point, the behavior will persist for longer time without reward. So it doesn't mean that every time the child does that correctly, you're going to reward him because he understands that he is not getting rewards because he's doing it correctly. He's just getting reward as an, as a byproduct, like, okay, you know, he's being good. So you're rewarding him. But if we're going to teach our children that every time you do something, I'll give you five rupees. You, you fold your clothes, I'll give you something. You clean your room, I'll give you something. We must, we must realize that that is wrong. Because then we are training them to work for the reward and not work because that skill has to develop. So even when you're doing remediation with kids or you're doing some kind of counseling with kids or you're sorting certain fights or something that you're doing in, in any form of intervention especially with a child or in any relationship do not keep continuous rewards as a form of treatment because that will be it'll be quick you will see a quick change but it will die out quickly rather go in for partially partial reinforcements where you know after a successive stage uh, you know don't keep it too random also but after every successive stage in uh, achieving something or whatever definitely present with some reinforcement so that you know the motivation to behave like that lasts longer and till it becomes a natural habit so now let's look at the last aspect all right and i promise you it's the last aspect of the topic today schedules of reinforcement the first look at the red tabs again interval schedule ratio schedule okay now interval schedule is related to time so you provide reinforcements based on intervals of time. So if I say that if I understand and uh, after a certain amount of checking from Monday to Friday, if most of your homework is complete and you've studied uh, at least half a chapter or one chapter every day, by Saturday, once I evaluate everything, I will give you a reward. So that is giving a reinforcement at a certain interval of time so you don't just give a reward every day or randomly it's pretty well decided and well planned so let's look at the first type now there are two types there is fixed and variable fixed and variable okay all right now let's look at the first one fixed interval schedule literally means a reinforcer is received after a fixed interval of time so every saturday after only after everything is reviewed and the child has done whatever 70 80 percent of the work you give him a reward this works best with behavior modification it's fixed and it makes the child wait for the reward to come so there is an interval also and it's fixed also right let's look at variable interval schedule of course this is again at a certain period of time there is interval but it's variable variable meaning it varies so the reinforcer is given after an unpredictable interval of time so sometime you will give him something in two days and then uh, maybe you 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 give him something very big for five days where in those five days he has not done anything at all and uh, then again after eight days you give him something small now in the next three days he does something significantly great but there is no reward so you see the pattern the the fluctuation it gives the child confusing signals that, you know, uh, you know, of course, I'm learning certain things, but there is no routine. And when there is no routine, I don't even get good feedback, not only in terms of praise, but also in terms of small reinforcements and rewards. So then why should I work? There is no structure. So in variable interval schedule, 
there is no real structure to as to when the reinforcements are given in terms of time okay so this is as simple as if you tell your child that every final exam or every year in your may vacations we are going to take a nice holiday provided you get a certain percentage overall percentage for that grade so this motivates the child to work hard throughout the year not just for the final exam but throughout the year in every test so you see a good amount of performance and he gets his fixed interval schedule but if you tell your child that you finish your first exam then i'll give you this and you've you've made a plan but you're not following through it and reinforcements are not given on the time planned and it's just random and unpredictable then your behavior will start dying out the behavior that you want your child to learn will start dying out so definitely use the first one for any type of uh, modification in behavior and counseling aspects but not the second right uh, the second one can also be used in terms of counseling if you have decided that for one month you will see a child twice every week uh try to stick around that schedule because the more varied your counseling sessions are with children the more uh, the lesser the effect or the efficiency of your counseling because there are some cases which need to be followed up probably twice a week once a week or whatever so keeping a fixed interval schedule your counseling itself is a reinforcer here you don't have to give a toffee to your child or a star to your child your counseling itself is a reinforcer here because it's allowing the child to vent out and share things with you and receive help so if you keep a good tab and get into the practice right now of being consistent with following up with cases keeping your data up to up to date uh, you know it's structured for you and you will see good results even with your children and your clients right let's move to the last part which is ratio schedule now ratio schedule is based on the number of responses okay so if you if you see that the child um does 10 sums a day right and every day does 10 sums of this topic and 10 sums of that topic at a certain amount in time in the week you're going to give him reinforcements so here it's not dependent upon time it's dependent upon the number of responses so if you give him a target if he achieves that target of repeating that behavior those many times you give him a reward right let's look at the first one fixed ratio schedule now we are doing ratio ratio why ratio because we are looking at number of responses okay fixed means you will provide the child with a reinforcer after a certain number of times a behavior is repeated right so um as simple as uh let's look at the example where um you give him uh copywriting every day one page and you say that after every 10 pages of copywriting we will do something that you really like which is hand painting but your copywriting has to be neat and your spellings have to be on point uh you know you you must uh, use full stops and capital letters wherever necessary and you you put down the rules and regulations for what you expect now the child really loves hand painting probably so you've used that as a reinforcer so what you're saying is after 6 days of copywriting from monday to saturday sunday you're going to sit with him for a good one hour and do some form of painting which he likes so that's a fixed ratio schedule based on the number of responses every day one day uh, one page of copywriting equals to one hour or two hours of painting and coloring is an example of fixed ratio schedule let's look at the next one variable ratio schedule is where you give a reinforcer after an unpredictable number of responses so one week you follow after 6 days you give him one hour of hand paint painting another day after one day only you give him uh, one hour of extra play uh, in the next week uh, then you don't follow up for the rest of the week then in the third week you come again and you tell him that okay let's work for two days together i want really i really want you to pick up these concepts and in return maybe you can uh, uh we can probably go and play in the park or uh, we'll have some group sessions so your reinforcers also change and uh you know even even the uh, clarity on how often the responses should be elicited also is uh, very unclear so basically this is also something that i would not recommend for behavior modification the more structure your work has in terms of 
you know changing behavior and helping children uh, the more effective your therapy and your counseling could be so of course uh, psychology and the whole area of therapy and counseling and remediation cannot be completely structured because there are a lot of human variables that come up which may disturb your schedule you may fall ill the child may fall ill but always try to keep some form of structure when you work in a field like this where reinforcements are involved motivation is involved praise is involved follow up is involved it it really helps it really helps to determine overall progress so um i need to catch a breath and um, you know this is this is what we we have we have uh, covered under just two theories of learning it's pretty vast but it's pretty simple go through the videos um you're going to be having um, a sort of an assignment uh, or an assessment i'll get back to you on that but uh, in a day or two but do prepare on the video uh, do prepare on the content do read your textbooks for more in depth information examples etc and not for the test all right not for the test because you have to score good points on your internship and because you want brownie points right which are your reinforcers don't do it for that do it for learning which is the topic for today all right so a lot of rel relative examples that i've given um uh let's just quickly do a recap we've covered uh, classical conditioning operant conditioning all the elements and concepts under it along with the experiments and we have co we've we've covered a lot of examples wherein you can apply these concepts with your children and with your field of work and with yourself even for your own habits even for for your own patterns which are unhealthy or probably some things that you need to change so make use of this and maybe when we meet next we can discuss a few instances where you can see all these elements playing out in your life and then we'll start working on our assignments based on this online video i hope i have done justice to this topic uh, if there is anything that is ambiguous throughout the video because i've i've spoken for more than an hour i'm sure i may have had one or two breaks somewhere in my thoughts so if you have any queries if you have any doubts anything that is um that uh, you have not understood uh, in what i have said please write back in email or please make a note of your doubts uh, or maybe we can discuss it in person when we meet on monday tuesday wednesday whenever and uh, definitely uh, you can reach out to me over messages and calls as well so thank you very much for your uh, time in terms of uh, being attentive in terms of comprehending what i have spoken and uh, trying to make connections with what you have just viewed i hope it's going to help you and uh, uh, let's let's meet soon and discuss your doubts thank you